Okay, so we now have the recording in progress. As I said, uh, our message today is about what it is we must do to receive salvation. Obviously, this is a, a big question and one of the fundamental questions that all people ask themselves at some point in time when considering faith or religion is what do I need to do to be saved or how can I be saved? And this question is really the second question we should be asking ourselves because who or what is God is the first question that we should ask. Now, this particular study is not going to cover the subject of who or what God is, as we have other study papers that cover that subject quite thoroughly. Uh, for purposes of this study, suffice it to say that God the Father is Yehovah. There is not any other being equal to or coexistent with him. He was alone prior to the creation of the angelic host and all the physical creation, and Christ was the head or the beginning of that creation from Revelation 3.14. And Jesus is not God the Father, nor is he equal to the Father. He was created as an angel, just like his fellows, until he was elevated above them from Psalm 45.7. So what is it? that we need to do in order to receive salvation. And what is salvation? It's likely that most of us find the answers to these questions rather surprising and at odds with what most of the mainstream religions would teach you. As I said, we don't adhere to um, what most mainstream Christianity adheres to. So when we talk about these questions and we go through our understanding of the answers to these questions, I think most would find it somewhat surprising. So first, let's look at the subject of salvation. Now, most mainstream Christians believe that when they die, they're going to either go to heaven or they're going to go to hell, depending on whether or not they've been good. And when you think about it, it's really not unlike the fairy tale of Santa Claus, right? Keeping a list of who's naughty and nice. And if you're nice, you get presents. And if you don't, you get nothing. You get coal. That's right. You get coal in your stocking. And in this case, if you're nice, you go to heaven. And if you're not nice, you go to hell. And there is a, uh, uh, there is a study that covers this concept of hell um, in great detail called Their Worm Shall Not Die. And in that paper, there is ample evidence that hell is a misconception and is not taught in Scripture. In fact, it was made up by man to leverage fear to keep people in obedience to the governing authorities, whether they be civil or religious or whatever. And all one must do is ask themselves what kind, and this, this is where a little bit of critical thinking goes a long way. And that's something that seems to be in short supply these days. Because our Father in Heaven is merciful above all else. Right? It's His mercy knows no bounds. Our mercy does. We're fallible. So He has mercy far beyond what we can even think about having. So when we ask ourselves, what kind of a merciful, loving father would desire to see his children 
burn and suffer torment for eternity. Right? You would have to struggle to come up with an answer because that question really destroys this whole idea of an eternal hell fire where the bad people are going to be tormented for eternity. Because our father doesn't correct us out of, out of some sort of uh, desire to, to uh, exert retribution for our actions. It's not out of vengeance. It is to correct wrong behavior. Right? The root of disciple is discipline. And the root of discipline is disciple, right? To discipline someone is to make a disciple out of someone, <laughs> right? So this concept of, of uh, and a, a torment, in, for, an eternal torment in hell is not in alignment with our God, our Father, being a loving Father and a merciful Father. Because it's very clear that no loving, merciful father would do that. Not even a human father would do such a thing to his own children, let alone our father in heaven. The merciful thing to do is let them die and be buried. Not torment them for eternity. What did Paul say? In Acts 2, 27 through 32, he says, For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Talking about David here, or what he was, he was quoting David. He said, You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Oops, sorry. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. So you see, David knew that he would not be abandoned in the grave. He knew that Christ was going to be resurrected. And Paul goes on to say that David's tomb is still with us. That is to say that he's still in it. He had not been brought out of that tomb yet. And Job also had this same understanding of the nature of death. In Job 19, 25 through 27, he said, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and the la at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. So he's talking about a time when he has decayed, but then he in his flesh will see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Right? He's going to see God with his own eyes not the eyes of another. He said, my heart faints within me. So Job knew that he was going to the grave and he was going to decay and return to the dust. He also knew that he would see God with his own eyes, not someone else's. You see, brethren, Job understood exactly what David and Paul and John also knew that there is a resurrection from the dead. But we won't die and be relegated to hell or heaven. Take a look at what it says in 1 Corinthians. 
in 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 49, Paul says, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies, right? So we cannot receive Aeonian life or what we would call eternal life without dying first. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. Right? We are not the same. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So we see here Paul explaining the nature of the resurrection. And we must remember that Jesus was raised to a physical resurrection. Right? He was walking around and talking to people and re remember the story of doubting Thomas, etc. So Christ was raised physical, a physical being first. And Paul continues on in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. He says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable body must put on the imperishable, and the mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. And that's an interesting statement. Right? The sting of death is sin. Sin is what brings death, death, right? The wages of sin is death. So sin brings death. And through sin, death was brought into the world. And what does it say? It says, and the power of sin is the law. Why is that? Because law defines what sin is. Paul said, without law, there is no sin. Sin is the transgression of the law by definition. So there had to have been law in place 
for this original sin to have occurred. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So, brethren, we won't all die, but we will all be changed. But wait a second, it says that it's given, it's appointed to all men once to die. But there will be those that are alive at the time when Christ returns, at the sound of that last trump. And the dead are raised first. They're brought back to this physical life. Now, here we are at the last trump. You've got those that are still alive, saints that have remained faithful until that time. The dead in Christ are raised up. And now we're all standing there together. And then, only then, will we be translated into the spirit realm. And we're changed at the same time, in the twinkling of an eye. And if we turn over to first. Thessalonians, it makes, makes it a little more clear, where it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now, notice that Paul did not say I don't want you to be uninformed about those people that are floating around on clouds up in heavens playing harps and doing all kinds of stuff. He didn't say that. He said those that are asleep. Death is likened to a state of being asleep. He goes on in verse 14, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For, those we declare, for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. We will not receive our reward before those have, who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them, with those dead, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So, here we see the the reward of the righteous is to receive a resurrection, not to die and go to heaven, but you are asleep until the time that Christ returns and restores godly order to this planet. But as far as I know, that time has not come. So, this is different than what you're going to hear in a lot of the churches. They're going to tell you that when you die, you're going to go to the pearly gates and that somebody's going to be there. St. Peter is going to be there at the pearly gates and he's got a list. He's going to check his list. Were you naughty or nice? Nice? Okay, open the gates. Naughty? Oh, down you go. Impugning the character of our father in heaven by making him to be a, a, a vengeful God who wants to see people suffer for their disobedience. Our father takes no pleasure in the pain of his children. So According to the Apostle Paul, the dead in Christ will be raised as flesh and blood human beings, and together with the saints that are alive at the time of the coming of Christ will be translated into spirit beings. 
and our resurrection will be just like Christ. From 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 23, it says, For as by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ each in his own order. We shall all receive the same resurrection as Christ. He was raised as a flesh, a flesh and blood human being, and so shall we be. And notice that it's each in his own order. First Christ, and then at his coming, right? And now if we, if we follow the logic of of all of those who would tell you that you're going to die and go to heaven, if as long as you listen to what they tell you, you come and sit down and you give them your offerings and your tithes and everything, you're going to make it into heaven. Because once saved, always saved, all you have to do is just, you know, get some water splashed on you and slapped in the forehead and you're good to go. Well, it doesn't work that way. It'd be nice if it was that easy, but it's not. Right? At his coming, those who remain faithful will be resurrected. They aren't in heaven. Otherwise, why would they need to be resurrected? They're in the grave, patiently awaiting the return of the Messiah, just as King David is. So this concept of heaven and hell is the same modus operandi that has been used to control people for millennia, and it's an adaptation of the Hegelian dialectic. There's the crisis or fear of dying and going to hell, and they come along with the solution. So they create this false narrative that you're going to die and go to hell. You don't behave yourself. You don't do what we tell you, but then they come along with the solution. The concept of hell was created to control people through fear. And remember, brethren, fear is your enemy. God has not given you a spirit of fear. He's given you a spirit of boldness, of courage. Fear not what man can do to you. But fear God who can destroy you forever. And this fear is, is evil, right? So they control you through fear. They're afraid of dying and going to hell, so they're looking for a savior. Well, they find it in the religious systems, which created the concept of dying and going to heaven and the concept of being under grace to keep people in their seats and paying their tithes and giving their offerings. And this process has proven to be very successful throughout millennia. And there is indeed hope, and there is a reward for faith and obedience, but it's not dying and going to heaven. Right? There is a plan that God has laid out, and John speaks of this plan. If you want to turn over to Revelation 20. In Revelation 20, 1 through 6. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended, right? So there's going to be a thousand year period where Satan is bound and not able to deceive the nations any longer. But after that, he must be released for a little while. And why is that? Well, this period of thousand years is known as the millennial period. And there will be children born throughout this millennial period that have never had to contend with Satan's influence. 
And it is required that all of us be tested. So if you don't have a negative influence, how is your character tested? It isn't. So in order to test, Satan has to be released and, and you know, allowed to do his thing once again. In verse 4, he says, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. So there is some sort of mark, whether it be a physical mark, a spiritual mark, whether it's the Sabbath, don't know for sure what it is. But there will be something that the saints, the faithful, will not take. And we need to keep our eyes open for it. It says, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Right? During that millennial period, they're reigning with Christ. It says, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Wait a minute. So, so all of the saints, those who had not received the mark on their foreheads or their hands, those who had remained faithful were in that resurrection. But it says here, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. I, wait a second, I thought that the dead were in hell. But apparently, John didn't think so. He said, blessed and holy are the, is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. This seems pretty clear to me. When Christ returns, he's going to bind Satan and lock him up for a thousand years. Those that are in the first resurrection, the saints, are raised and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Where? On the earth. They weren't in heaven at all. And notice that this is only the first resurrection. Now, this implies that there is another resurrection. And also notice the fact that there is a second death, and that second death has no power over those in the first resurrection. Again, this implies that there are two deaths. Um, and that only applies to some which are in another group that is resurrected at a later time. Let's continue reading. Look at Revelation 27 through 15. And when the thousand years were ended, Satan will be released, like it said, from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are in the at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, that sounds like eternal hellfire to me, but is it really? This subject of this lake of fire is covered in the study paper, The Plan of God. And as is explained in that paper very well, this is a lake of cleansing. It's not an eternal fire of torment. This is the fire of cleansing. Things thrown into this fire are purified and tested and refined. And this is not really understood by most. Because we want to see those evil people punished with eternal punishment, eternal torment. We'll show you 
See, we have vengeance in our hearts, or our God and Father does not. So the rest of the dead are now raised in what is indeed a second resurrection. And again, I would encourage you to look further into this concept of the lake of fire, because it's not what you think it is. So the rest of the dead are now raised in what is indeed a second resurrection. They weren't part of the saints that were already resurrected, but apparently weren't burning away in some eternal hell fire either. Death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. Death is destroyed. So death is not an individual running around on the planet with, you know, um, like the Grim Reaper. These are concepts that are destroyed. Death is destroyed. There will be no more death. And we are not really told what happens during this second resurrection. But it does seem logical that these people that are raised up in this second resurrection would be taught the proper way to live, and that during this second life, and it's a, a good argument can be made for that life being 120 years, you know, given you've got, you know, 40 generations um, between creation and the flood, 40 between the flood and and the birth of Christ, and then from the birth of Christ to, to the, his return, 40, 40, 40, 40 jubilees. So this concept of 120 is not um, too far, you know, too far-fetched. But during this time of resurrection, after the re they are resurrected, they are going to learn to live Yah's way of life. And then at the end of that life, the theory goes that they will receive their crown and be translated to spirit beings. And they will join the saints that went before them in the first resurrection. And this, uh, this concept of... Uh, Salvation is an achievement of aeonian life or what is termed eternal life in the kingdom of God, the one true God whose name is Jehovah. And it is our Father's will that no flesh should be lost. You turn over to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 6. It says, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of our God, of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So we must ask ourselves, if it is the will of God that all people be saved, who can deny that? Who can defy the will of God, the almighty creator of the universe? No one can. So why do we want to see those evildoers burn in hell? Our father doesn't want to see that. His will is that all flesh be saved. And if our job as Christians and saints is to become more like our elder brother, who was the mirror image of God the Father in his character, so in essence, we have to become more like our Father in heaven in character, we should not want to see anybody burn in hellfire. Vengeance is mine, saith Jehovah. Vengeance is not ours. 
So what do we need to do to receive that salvation, to receive that position in the kingdom of God, to receive that place in the first resurrection, to be found worthy to stand before the Son of Man at his return? What is it that we have to do? When Jesus was approached with the question about what one must do to receive eternal life or aeonian life, he responded thusly in Matthew 9, 16 through 30. It says, and behold, a man came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Right? Like it's a, it's a checkbox. You just check off. Oh, that's done. Got it. Eternal life. Thank you. And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. He says, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said, all of these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And what that means is it's, it's uh, easier for a fully laden camel to get through a needle gate in the walls of Jerusalem, which were very narrow. So what ended up happening, to ha they would have to, take all of the stuff off the camel and get through the gate and then reload it. And so it was very difficult to get through those gates. But he's saying that it's going to be easier for the camel to get through the needle gate than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, see, we have left nothing or left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, in the new world, when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my namesake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. When when he was asked, Jesus answered in a two-part response. The first, there is only one who is good, and that is God the Father. And this adds further credence to this fact that Jesus did not consider himself equal with the Father. And Paul reaffirms this in Philippians 2.6. In Philippians 2.6, it says, Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. You see, Satan was the opposite. He said, I will elevate myself above the throne of God. I will be like the Most High. Satan wanted to be equal with God, above God. But we're told, you shall have no other gods before me, beside me, equal to me. 
and the whole of mainstream Christianity and Catholicism is founded on the idea that there is a triune God, that God the Father, Christ, and the Holy Spirit are all three equal and separate beings. It is a lie. The second part of the answer was straight and to the point. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Now, when questions as, as to which ones he should keep, Jesus recited a portion of the Ten Commandments. He included the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, and the fifth. And then he throws in the second great commandment, which covers all the last six commandments, which is love your neighbor as yourself. And they are they pertain to the relationship uh, between your fellow men, right, with each other. He totally left out the commandments pertaining to the relationship between man and his creator. Jesus is referencing or referring to the Ten Commandments. So why did he leave those out? And we'll see that Jesus was simply quoting a portion of the law, but wasn't quoting the entire law. He's simply pointing out which law had to be kept in order to receive that Aeonian life. And that is the moral law of God. That is the contract the law and the prophets. The young man stated that he had kept these laws. And Jesus told him that if he wanted to be perfect, he had to sell all his possessions and follow them. And this proved to be too much for the young man. And he went, went away, sad. It's like, okay, well, you know, eternal salvation is not worth all my money, so I'll talk to you later. And the whole point of that story, I think, is really encapsulated in verses 23 and 24. Which says, and Jesus said to the, his disciples, truly, I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. You see, material possessions and a desire for wealth can keep us from putting Yah and his ways first, right? Because there are certain things that you can't engage in. There are certain things you can't do. Certain businesses that don't lend themselves to those seeking to do what their Father in heaven tells them. And remember what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 10. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39, he said, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. You see, when you turn and you start to obey your father in heaven, people are not going to like it. Because it flies in the face of their traditions, their belief system that has been established on a bed of lies. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or da daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You see, if we allow anything to become a greater priority than seeking the kingdom, then we're not going to be found worthy. 
And Jesus further reiterated this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 through 34, where he says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What is the righteousness of God? And this is what Christ told us to do. Well, let's take a look at the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 19, verses 7 through 11. It says, the law of Yehovah is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of Yehovah is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of Yehovah are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yehovah is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yehovah is clean, enduring forever. The rules of Yehovah are true and righteous altogether. Maybe that's the righteousness of God. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warm. In keeping them, there is great reward. So this, these rules, these laws, these commandments, they are righteous altogether. Look at Psalm 119, verse 172. Let my voice sing about your word because all your commands are good. And then if we turn over to the New Testament in the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verses 3 through 10. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices what? Lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And we're not talking about this legal system that man has created on this planet that is tyrannical and oppressive and is designed to steal all of our prosperity, this is talking about the law of God. Sin is lawlessness. Verse 5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever practices, um, sorry, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born, born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed, God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. But this is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. You see, we have to practice righteousness. We have to keep the law because that is righteousness. Turn over to the book of 2 John, verses 4 through 6. 
says, I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, right? We're told to love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. You see, these commandments are just as applicable today as they always have been. Look at Romans chapter 7, verse 12 and 14. For we know, sorry, uh, verse 12, so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. So the law is holy. The law is good. It's righteous. It's spiritual. The law of Yah is all of those things. And Jesus wasn't excluding any of the law by his reference to some of the commandments when he answered the young man in, in Matthew. And the apostle John clarifies it quite succinctly. Look at uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> he says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, right? He stands as our mediator. We're going to sin. We're imperfect. But as time goes on and we mature in the spirit and we're continually transformed by the renewing of our minds through the Holy Spirit, we sin less and less. And there seems to be, at least in, in nature itself, as we age, our propensity for sin is less. Because all of the things that seem to matter to us when we were younger no longer matter. <laughs> so it kind of goes hand in hand, I guess. It says, he is the propitiation, verse 2, of our, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. I don't know how much more clear that can be, and the truth is not in him. So if you say that you know Christ, that you have a personal relationship with Christ, or with our Father in heaven, and you don't keep the commandments, according to John here, you're a liar, and the truth is not in you. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. So be wary, brethren, of any of those people out there that would tell you that the law does not apply to you because you're under grace. We are under grace. But grace does not remove the requirement of the law. It says in verse 5, but whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Again, Christ was the mirror image. He who has seen me has seen the Father. He walked in the ways of God. The law of God is spiritual. It emanates from the character of God. You want to be more like God the Father and our elder brother and high priest and Messiah Yehoshua or Jesus, then 
keep the law. Do what our Father tells us to do. Because, see, we don't get to just make up things for ourselves. It was all laid out for us. This is how you live your life. This is the type of people you are to be. And Christ came to this earth to reiterate what it is you're supposed to be doing. He made it clear. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. He says, don't suppose that I came to do away with the law and the prophets, a clear reference to the Old Testament. I did not come to do away with them. How much more clear can it be? But to give them their full meaning, to bring into light the full essence of the law. He says, heaven and earth may disappear, but I promise you that not even a period or comma will ever disappear from the law. Everything written in it must happen. If you reject even the least important command in the law, and this is important for any of those people out there, me, you, whoever, that are inclined to attempt to teach other people about God and his ways. You better pay attention to these verses. If you reject even the least important command in the law and teach others to do the same, you will be the least important person in the kingdom of heaven. Now notice he doesn't say you're not going to be in the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say, well, you are going to be the least important person in hell. No, you are going to be the least important person in the kingdom of heaven. But if you obey and teach others its commands, you will have an important place in the kingdom. You must obey God's commands better than the Pharisees and the teachers of the law obey them. If you don't, I promise you that you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So we see that the requirement to keep the commandments is very much alive and well. And when Jesus told the young man that in order to receive eternal life or Aeonian life, he must keep the commandments, he was referring to the law of God in its entirety. Minus the sacrificial system, which he fulfilled as a sacrifice once for all. The Apostle James adds to that understanding. In James chapter 1, verses 21 through 25, it says, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, right? It's not something you go to church every Sunday and you have all this stuff blown in your face and it bounces off your forehead and you walk out the same person you were before you went in. That's not how this works. Be doers of the word. See, it requires change in our lives, change in our behavior. That's difficult. Nobody said this was easy. Narrow is the gate. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what man he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law is perfect. The law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And this is why we don't have an understanding of the law 
right from the get-go. If we understood all of the areas where we fall short all at once, we would be overwhelmed and consumed. But our Father reveals it over time so that we can absorb it. The law of Yah is something one must live in order to obey. If we espouse a belief in Yah, then we cannot divorce ourselves from his moral law. We cannot say the law doesn't apply. We're not under the law. We're under grace. And just a quick note, you're only under the law, which means in its grasp, its penalty, if you break it. If you don't break the law, the law has no effect on you. Who cares? Huh. The law is only there to tell me what I need to do, but I'm already doing it. So I'm, I'm not in any danger. The keeping of the law is also apparent in the gospel message. It started with John the Baptist's message. What did John the Baptist say? Matthew 3, verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, sounds pretty simple. And Jesus also carried that same message in Mark 1, 15, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. We are called to repentance. But what is repentance? Repentance is the Greek word metaneo, which according to Thayer means to change one's mind for better, heartily to amend with aberrance of one's past sins. So repentance from sin is our calling, and sin is defined very clearly by the Apostle John. In 1 John 3, 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So we have to repent or turn away from sin, which is lawlessness. This whole concept that the law doesn't apply and that we're under grace is a Gnostic view. That because the law is physical, but we already read that the law is spiritual, because the law is physical, we must get as far away from the law as possible in order to become more spiritual. That's their concept. <laughs> kind of odd. Not surprising that it's contrary to what God says, because these people are deceived by their father, the devil. So in order to receive salvation, we must repent, which is to stop breaking the law of God. That's step one. Step two is baptism, which comes into play after the gift of the Holy Spirit, which was given at Pentecost. And we can see that in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 33 through 39 which says, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And this is a reference to the, the tongues of fire that were above the heads and, and everything when they received the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So look at that. He says, the Lord said to my Lord. God the Father said to Christ, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart 
and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. In this, in this phrase, in the name of Jesus Christ, means by the authority of Jesus Christ. For forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So <clears throat> we are to be baptized. And through baptism and the laying on of hands, we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The great commission of the church given by Jesus himself is to preach the gospel and to baptize. Look at Mark, the book of Mark, chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. Verse 15. 15, it says, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In, the, in, in my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. And we saw that with the apostles or the disciples all through um, the Gospels. And this Gospel is the Gospel of God. It is the Gospel of our Father in heaven. What did he say in verse 14 of chapter 1, the book of Mark? Now, after John was arrested, James came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. And this gospel is twofold. First, it is a gospel of hope in that the long-awaited Messiah has now come in the form of Jesus, the Christ. And the second is in a message of instruction as it calls us to repentance from our sins and to return to the perfect spiritual and holy law of the one true God. So brethren, if we go back to the original question of what one must do to receive salvation, it is two things, two things that we have to do. The first is to repent. We must cease doing those things that are contrary to the laws of God and begin to keep the law as was intended for man from the beginning of time. We've seen that Jesus kept the law and taught that the law must be kept. He said that not one punctuation mark would disappear from the law. Heaven and earth would pass away before that happens. The very definition of repentance contains the element of a return to law keeping. And salvation cannot be attained without the keeping of the law. It just can't. We must be baptized and have hands laid upon us for receipt of the Holy Spirit, which leads us into a complete understanding of the truth. Turn over to John chapter 16, verse 13. It says, when the spirit of truth comes, this is the Holy Spirit, it will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. As we exercise the spirit and keep the law of Yah, it becomes more and more of who we are. It becomes part of us, ingrained in our character. And this is how we are transformed. Turn over to the book of Romans, chapter 12. In Romans 12, 2, it says, do not be conformed to this world. Don't do what 
the heathen do. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, we are going undergoing a renewal, a transformation. We are being made perfect. The keeping of the law is essential, and it is incumbent upon anyone who would assume the role of a teacher to teach the law correctly. As we read in Matthew 5, 19, therefore, who relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The way to salvation in the kingdom of the one true God is summed up by Solomon. If you turn over to Ecclesiastes, book of Ecclesiastes, page 12, or page 12, chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. If you want to be found worthy, if you want to receive that gift of salvation, repent, stop being lawless, return to the law of God, obey the law, keep the covenant. And that applies to all of the law. That means the calendar system, which includes the feasts, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the, the moral law, the, you know, the Ten Commandments, keeping the Sabbath, all of the law. So if you want to be found worthy, to stand before the Messiah at his return and receive that crown, which you're working so hard to receive, you must return to the keeping of the law. You must be baptized and have hands laid upon you to receive the Holy Spirit. These are the things that are required. This is what we must do to receive the gift of eternal life and enter into the kingdom of God. So with that then, um, we will, that's the end of uh, my message today. So with that then, we will uh, close our formal service and 